Charliesville. It's a good name. It's a community. It's people. And for 100 years, it's been a bank. The story of Harleysville Savings Bank is the story of Harleysville. It's a story we want to know and to share with you. A story of a good name. It began around 1850 as little more than a wagon and stagecoach stop at a hotel along a country turnpike. But by the end of the century, there was an unmistakable village strung out along a definite main street. The surrounding fields were dotted with thriving farms. Many of families descended from the first Mennonite, Church of the Brethren, and Schwankfelder settlers of the area. These were hard-working Pennsylvania Dutch-speaking people who valued thrift, mutuality, and integrity, and whose meeting houses were, like them, plain. They could work alongside their Lutheran and Reformed neighbors, perhaps for one of Harleysville's clothing manufacturers, responsible for much of the local economic development. Like many of the young village's growing businesses, they were the work of another wave of enterprising German immigrants arriving around mid-century. Improvements like the raising of electric lines on Main Street would benefit all and require a collective effort. A community chapel was built along Maple at the time called Creamery Avenue. The creamery beside it, where local farmers could bring their milk for processing, began as a joint stock company, a fine example of civic cooperation. After a stop there, farmers might tie their milk wagons up at the Booker Brothers store at the corner and visit for a while, or head up to Harleysville's second general store at Broad Street, run by Menno Clemens, which would one day evolve into Hennings. Lower Salford's other villages had their commercial centers as well. Lederach, the oldest, with its own inn and store, at one time outpaced Harleysville. Entering the township, the village of Mainland had its own creamery and a thriving butchering trade. And above the store in Vernfield was a clothing factory and later a printing plant. The rural economy was based on small farms which could take their grain to the local mill and, as roads and transportation improved, were increasingly able to send their produce to markets like the one on Girard Avenue in Philadelphia. Harleysville had by now enough sense of identity and business trade to support its own newspaper in a stylish new building beside the hotel. In its pages was evidence of a business community with a growing need for investment services to provide the capital needed to fuel the village economy. It was an enterprise that some of Harleysville's prominent people were ready to take up. Chief among them was Alvin Clemens Aldifer, who had been a surveyor, school teacher, store clerk, partner in a clothing factory, and eventually justice of the peace. With Alvin acting as president, the officers and directors of the Harleysville National Bank opened their doors for business in 1909, welcoming customers and stockholders into their new building and what they called a new era for Harleysville. A few years later, on the site of the former news building a few doors down from the bank, the Harleysville Beneficial Association offered life insurance benefits. Again, Alvin Aldifer was instrumental, and as Harleysville was connecting more and more with the world around it, he reflected the mix of industry, thrift, and integrity at the heart of the community's character. Arthur Aldifer would work for his uncle Alvin and learn from him as well. He taught by example, and he taught a thrift. He always said, now you save some of that money, uh, save 10%, uh, you'll be glad you did and you won't miss it, you know. And uh, he always taught us to be honest. I think that's the secret of success of any organization, to treat the people right. There was more in store for Alvin Aldifer's hometown. In his home on Main Street, he established an auto theft association to be known generally as the Harleysville Insurance, eventually Harleysville's largest business. It was all evidence of a frugal, coherent community where neighbor worked alongside neighbor, 
as Alvin's son-in-law Norm Berge and future bank director Ernie Delp remembered. There was a certain community of spirit, I believe, when there's cows to be milked in the community, or hay to be made, and weed to be cut. Farmers grouped together. The community spirit got together. I always appreciated the cooperation of everybody in this town, and there was always a comradeship, it seemed, and a togetherness, and I think that's what helped to make Harleysville what it is today. With a homegrown insurance company, a bank providing commercial loans to fuel a vital village business life, and thriving farms with their market trade, there was yet one piece missing in the local economic development. How were Lower Salford's families able to own a home without first a lifetime of saving or borrowing from family or friends? Couldn't the will and goodwill of the community come together to make that possible? A group of the area's leading citizens joined together to provide an answer. There was Squire Alvin Alderfer, of course, and Dr. Vincent Keeler, also of the Harleysville National Bank Board. Dr. Keeler's brother, veterinarian J. Ryan Keeler, a member of Harleysville's well-known medical community. Jacob Moyer, proprietor of the bakery at the intersection of Main Street and the road to Souderton. Maurice Kerr, a farmer and huckster with his house in the village. And Alan Metzger, photographer and chronicler of Harleysville life from his house and studio on Main Street. The names are not of bankers, or even of men with much other than a practical education, but of neighbors, residents Harleysville, who valued their home and each other. Together, they petitioned to form the Harleysville Building and Loan Association on February 16, 1915. Their character and motivation is understood by Sanford Aldifer, who grew up on a lower Salford farm to become a businessman and bank director himself. These were all local men interested in their community, and they were supposed to help that person that was going to buy a half a twin for $1,400, or a whole house for $4,000, and lending money to good family men and women that were providing a home for their children. The Harleysville Building and Loan Association's bylaws established a cooperative, community-directed means of systematic saving and lending organized with what Ed Molnar describes as a clear purpose. Harleysville Building and Loan was a mutual form of ownership. The people that saved were the owners. They were the owners. They elected the board of directors every year. And so the Harleysville Building and Loan had no profit motivation. It was all to serve the community. That was their charter. That's what they were founded for, making home mortgages. It was a path toward home ownership that required goodwill, committed directors, and strong connections to the community and its people. But in those early years, not much in the way of administrative or office overhead. They really had no home. They had no office. And so if someone needed to either build or buy a home, they would approach one of the directors. And then the directors would actually go out and look at the property and determine whether the value was there. And then the directors used to collect money through a vehicle called serial shares. A share was a dollar a month, and they would mature, usually in about 12 years. And that's how they got their capital and would loan it out to people to buy homes. And so when an individual came for a loan, the directors pretty much knew them. I mean, they knew their character, and it was pretty much, well, the house is worth $5,000, and the person wants to borrow 3000 their credit's good. We know they work at Harleysville Insurance Company. We know they have a, a good job up there, so we'll give them the loan. And that's, that's basically the way things went. And so it did for many Lower Salford families, as Secretary Alvin Alderfer recorded their monthly payments and each year's serial share offering grew in value. By 1926, the first series had matured and the first mortgages were satisfied including one for $700 given for a home at 555 Main Street, still standing today. By now, Russell Hillegas was recording payments as a number of the 11 original directors retired. Their replacements represented a widening geographical area, even as far as Fairview Village, Lansdale, and Elroy. 
though the list of shareholders voting for directors was still a who's who of Lower Salford names. By 1942, one name no longer on the ballot was Alvin C. Alderfer, creative force behind the Harleysville Building and Loan Association, as well as the Harleysville National Bank and the Harleysville Insurance Company, now located in the original bank building, where the building and loan also held their shareholders' meeting. But just a little further down Main Street was their true place of business, conducted by the director replacing Alvin Alderfer, Edwin B. Heckler. Storekeeper Eddie Heckler would serve as a director, secretary, and treasurer, and become, in the minds of many of his neighbors, the face and heart of the Harleysville Building and Loan. Herb Neckel, for many years a township supervisor, remembered Harleysville and Eddie as a young man. Eddie was a good businessman. He had Heckler's store, and I can remember when I was interested in buying my first home. I talked to my dad, and then I went to Eddie Heckler, and it was through Eddie's generosity and confidence in me, I guess, that I bought my home. And I feel Eddie had a big part in me being able to own what I own today. Herb's Harleysville of the 1940s, though still surrounded by extensive fields and active farms, was spreading out from its center. It was at the time perhaps best known as the home of the live poultry auction, run by Alvin Alderfer's son-in-law, Harry Clemens, drawing crowds and trucks into town every Wednesday. Business was good even through the war years, and the building and loans assets grew steadily, due in part to conservative board management. Some buildings in town came down to make way for evidence that Harleysville was modernizing as well. Still, the people of the community and the building and loan that served them were bound by an old-fashioned bond of neighborliness and interdependence. But the character and the landscape of this largely rural, self-contained community was beginning to show signs of change. In 1955, the northeast extension of the Pennsylvania Turnpike cut through the corner of Lower Salford, and truly, a new era began. It was the same year that, after 40 years, the Harleysville Building and Loan Association reached $1 million in assets. Even the Philadelphia newspaper reported that Harleysville was getting ahead. It was time to acknowledge the building and loan's growth by moving out of the cash drawer at Eddie Heckler's store into the association's first true home office on Main Street. Present to cut the ribbon was Maurice Kerr, treasurer and an active director since 1915, beside Eddie Heckler and surrounded by Lester Fellman, Russell Hillegas, Howard Metzger, Roland Culp, Harold Allabach, William Mester, and Ernest Delp. Along with regular hours came some office staff as well. Regina Aldifer worked along with Secretary Eddie Heckler's daughter, Corinne, though at first on a limited scale. When I got there, we had, I can never remember if it was one wastebasket and two phones or two phones and one wastebasket. And he did everything by hand, everything. The building and loans home mortgage business was still based on serial shares. Director Howard Metzger might collect payments while sharpening mower blades in his shop on Main Street, having succeeded his father, photographer Alan Metzger. There was still a cohesive, small-town feel to Harleysville, reflected in the way business was conducted. You could walk. <laughs> you could walk anywhere, and you knew almost everybody in town. You could come in and shake their hand, you know, and that would be all you'd need. You didn't have to have everything, 25 sheets of paper to sign and all that good stuff. But as the scope of Regina's work expanded to include savings accounts, the building and loans name was changed to Harleysville Savings and Loan Association in 1959. Did Howard Metzger, Ernie Delp, and Les Fellman out for a wagon ride with their Harleysville buddies know what a period of fundamental change was underway? Secretary Eddie Heckler set in motion an almost three-year process of inquiry, assessment, compliance, and reorganization that would lift the hometown association to new levels of security and service. He had the foresight in 1965 to apply for federal uh, insurance on depositors' accounts, 
Prior to that time, the accounts at Harleysville Savings Bank were not insured by the federal government. Qualification meant that serial shares would no longer be the basis for saving and lending. Board officers who were also officers of other financial institutions, like Union National or Harleysville National Bank, would have to resign. Eddie Heckler himself had to give up his real estate and insurance business. But the end result, in the Savings and Loans 50th year, was membership in the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, with the guarantee of federal deposit insurance. What had not changed in the transition was the association's primary purpose, to provide economical home financing consistent with a fair return to its shareholders. It was still Harleysville's way to thrift and home ownership. Eddie especially was really interested in seeing the savings alone grow and prosper here in, in Harleysville for the benefit of the community, really, because we had no stockholders. And so the larger that the company became, the more successful it was, the more prosperous it would be for the community. But the success Eddie Heckler and the directors had promoted for their association and community required a new measure of involvement and sophistication. Harleysville auctioneer and realtor Sanford Aldifer had recently been recruited to replace Maurice Kerr, the last of the 1915 charter directors. He recalls the response of his fellow directors to this new world of banking. They were just local men that put this thing together and they were looking for someone to replace them because they needed somebody that had the latest that it took in banking. And Edwin B. Heckler was the one who asked for help. Help was to come in the person of young Edward J. Molner, educated in the thrift industry by time spent at Quakertown and Red Hill Savings and Loans. The forward-thinking directors made their intentions clear. We want to uh, have an impact here on the community. There was that vision that was there. It wasn't a case of, you know, we want to hire somebody, but don't make any changes. Don't make it, you know. They, they wanted someone that would come in and, and uh, have some vision to grow the bank. There was, as perhaps could be expected, some trepidation on the part of the office staff. Yeah, I remember we thought, oh boy, here comes this young uh, whippersnapper, he's going to take this over. <laughs> we were kind of nervous about it, but it worked out well. <laughs> Harleysville was to Ed a new culture with new responsibilities and a wealth of experience to learn from. There was no such system that we have today with professional appraisers. In fact, when I came, I did that too. That was one of my early responsibilities to make sure that the loans that we were making were, were secured. And I would go out with two other directors. And of course, they knew the area. I mean, they really knew the area. They really taught me a lot. There was a new vocabulary of names and families to serve and appreciate. Yeah, all the fur landis, I mean, you knew the people. You knew the quality of the people that you were dealing with. Ed was not adverse to trying some new approaches like a remarkably successful S&H Green Stamps program. Increased office traffic and growing assets perhaps prompted the board to take up the issue of their cramped headquarters soon after Ed's arrival. Yes, they were in the heart of Main Street, but space for expansion was limited and entry and exit were difficult. We had just outgrown the building. Of course, we knew that people were beginning to want convenience with drive-up windows and things like that. And so we were just undecided about it. And lo and behold, Sanford came back with a track of ground down here at the corner, Clemens Road in 63. I went and called Ed Mulner and I said, I just saw the track of land we ought to buy to put in our new office. And that was out of town. I was way down at Clemens Road. We were a mile out of the village, you know. Of course, at that time, there was really nothing down at this end of town. Convinced that the Turnpike Interchange would draw development toward it, Bank President Lester Fellman and bank officials broke ground in an empty field on November 16, 1970, for what was to be their new $125,000 office building. They had already addressed the question of style, following the advice of building committee chair Bill Mester. Always build a traditional building, because if you don't, they will date themselves someday. 
So that's why all of our buildings are the traditional Williamsburg style buildings because of Bill Mester. In the summer of 1971, following remarks by Secretary Ed Molnar and to the satisfaction of Sanford Aldifer, the ribbon was cut and Eddie Heckler could wonder at the road they had traveled. Not long after, in the fields across the road, a new Henning supermarket seemed to second the bank's choice of location. Still, it didn't seem right that they were outside the perimeter marked by the village sign. So I went to the township and asked them if they could please move the sign down further so we could be part of the community, and they did. With the new building came another name change, with Harleysville Savings and Loan becoming Harleysville Savings Association, still distinct from a bank. But other small area building and loans, like the one in Sumneytown, took notice of the longevity, stability, and growth Harleysville displayed and found it attractive, signaling a period of expansion. We were one office until 1974. In 1974, we merged with the Sumneytown Savings Loan. And again, we're mutual, we're not stock, so there's no financial gain in this thing for anybody but they felt that they'd be better served by merging with a company like Harleysville, and so we ended up building an office there in Sumneytown. The history and development of the Sumneytown building alone had in many ways paralleled Harleysville's. It was operating out of the offices of realtor and secretary Paul Barnt, who recognized his thrift needed a partner that shared their values. We at Sumneytown had to do something. We were too small to exist and my board loved it and Ed's board loved it. So uh, it was a good move on the part of both institutions. Like the directors at Harleysville, whose board he joined as a result of the merger, Paul Barnt was motivated by a commitment to community banking. The reason for doing it, I think, is better public service. I hear people today saying, I much rather deal with a community bank. While the opening of the new Sumneytown branch was still in process, a merger with the West Norristown Building and Loan Association was also underway, resulting in a third office in West Norriton Township in 1977. It was followed shortly by a fourth in the Snyder Square Shopping Center in Hatfield, expanding Harleysville's reach in the opposite direction. New faces, such as Hatfield branch manager Ron Geib, joined the team. Ron recalls his early education in Harleysville's business model and its strengths. At that time, we were here to serve the residential needs of the community, the consumer needs, the first mortgages, the equity loans, and uh, basically it was all consumer focused. It was a, a model that was rather simple. We did what we did, we did it very well. It brought strong values to the bank. Customer service was very important. The Savings Association's people pleasers grew to include other new additions, many of whom would play major roles in Harleysville's unfolding story. Marion Aldifer, Jane Hager, Diane Moyer, and Francis Sable. They would need the strength and good judgment of everyone to see them through the difficult financial times the country was entering. That early 80 period from 1979 to about 82 was a very, very dangerous period for the banking industry. The bonds of the Lower Salford community would need to join the value of tradition and stability with the energy of the new. For the savings and loan, inflation and high interest rates approaching 20% carried a threat of the bank paying more on deposits than they earned on their mortgage loans. Ed Molnar, in particular, created some innovative products and services to see the Savings Association and its customers through these trying times. We were actually the second bank in Pennsylvania to offer an adjustable rate mortgage to our customers. For Harleysville, these were times that affirmed the strength of their community model, rather than revealing the weaknesses of some other financial institutions and their practices. There was never any tension between myself and the board of directors, never, ever. I think they saw that the principles that I operated at the bank under were very conservative principles, and I gained their trust. Our directors have always been ones that understand the culture of the bank, 
principles that are enduring. I remember sitting at a board meeting with Sanford back in the 1980s. We had really high interest rates. We had uh, prime up at 20%. And he just sat back and said, you know, Ron, this too shall pass. Let's not val violate principles that we do understand. And, and short term, if we can stay true to who we are, in the long run, this will work out. It was a prudent assessment and strategy, not pushing beyond the model that had served them for 65 years. I mean, we didn't expand. We couldn't. We couldn't during those periods because they were so uh, critically important to make sure that we, re that we maintained our strength. Although we continued to grow, we continued to grow at a nice pace. The time did pass, and Harleysville's measured growth brought them to the threshold of their next great step forward. In 1987, is when we decided to become a public company. That was a big, big decision. Because we're moving out of this era that we just came through, we think there's gonna be tremendous opportunity here for growth, and so we need to really build our capital base. And that's when we decided to go out and offer a public offering to our, first of all, to our customers. And we wanted to do that because we wanted the ownership of the bank to remain in residents of Harleysville and Satterton and, you know, their surrounding area. And our customers bought most of it. The confidence expressed in Harleysville by the people of their community as they moved from a mutual to a stock form of ownership was well-founded, with growth and profits far exceeding industry standards. Reflecting the expanded array of customer services they were moving into, Harleysville Savings Association became Harleysville Savings Bank in 1988. And in the bank's 75th anniversary year, there was a major expansion of the main office building with additional loan servicing facilities and drive through lanes. It was an era when the bank's officers said goodbye to some of their long-term directors like Roland Culp and Ernie Delp, whose work and vision had proven so enduring and it was to sustain continued growth, strengthening what Harleysville did best, community banking and customer service. One, two, three, go. The Hatfield branch moved to a new freestanding building in 1995, and not long after, the West Norriton branch was doubled in size. Automatic teller machines were added at each of the four branches. What? What do you mean we're down? How can we be down? Ah, oh, Jim just put in a new backup power supply. Some technological innovations seem to remain something of a challenge. Oh, Must be in here. <laughs> Regina! <laughs> and some people just might never catch on. Now this is progress. I finally don't have to dial a nine. Nonetheless, the Y2K disaster would be successfully averted. Harleysville Savings Bank teamed with Harleysville National Bank and the Harleysville Insurance Companies, the other two institutions Alvin C. Aldifer had helped to found, to open a recreation area, a representation of Alvin's contribution to the life and vitality of his hometown. A management team that grew to include Brendan McGill as chief financial officer in 1999 was soon to lose Diane Moyer after 28 years of service. Sanford Aldifer as well would reach retirement age with a sense of what the years had meant to him. Next to my church family and our own business, the next in line was Harleysville Savings. You know, it was Directors continuing Sanford's work would oversee the formation of a bank holding company in 2001, the Harleysville Savings Financial Corporation, creating new options for financial flexibility and stock repurchases. The bank's service footprint was greatly extended when, in 2001, your trusted financial partner arrived in Lansdale, the bank's fifth location. That was the year Trustee was introduced, putting a friendly face on savings for kids throughout the community. Within a year, the first branch office at Sumneytown, now approaching 30 years old, was renovated and modernized. And as the bank neared its 90th anniversary, Chief Operating Officer Ron Geib was named as its fifth president. The opening of a new branch office in Upper Providence in 2006 coincided with a strong initiative extending Harleysville's tradition of community banking and customer service into the business community as well. 
we looked at our future and we said, you know what, we've been primarily a thrift home ownership type business and we see the need really to begin to do more business relationships in the community. This is one segment of the market that truly appreciates a relationship with the decision makers. And that to us is going to be our strategic initiative going forward in being there to serve small business owners who want to know their banker. They can tell their story because no two are alike. But at the same time we're building those relationships, we still have a commitment to the consumer. Perhaps that continued commitment to customer and community is best seen in the small branch offices maintained at two area retirement communities beginning in 2006. Some of that is our community hat that we wear. Being in our community and wanting to be the community bank, it's something we can do. And then people tell people. A year after Ron Guy was named Harleysville Savings Bank's chief executive officer, he joined others of the bank team in celebrating 20 years as a NASDAQ-listed public company. And shortly thereafter, when their much larger neighbor, Harleysville National Bank, became part of First Niagara, the name Harleysville belonged to Harleysville Savings Bank alone. With Harleysville National Loan Locker being in the marketplace, it has given us an advantage because they're not there competing with that Harleysville name. We are now known as the Harleysville Bank. The measured extension of the Harleysville name continued with the opening of a Souderton branch in 2010. Approaching a major milestone, it was important to understand the lessons of the past and build on them into the future. The fact that Harleysville Savings Bank still stands here strong and growing at the viable future after 100 years of being in operation says that our legacy must contain a lot of individuals that made decisions of enduring values and so we want to understand what those principles are so we can embrace them, we can grow upon them, and this is why succession planning is so important for the bank. We need individuals that understand the values, the relationships, and principles. And as long as that continues, those principles are embraced, then there's a bright future. Harleysville Savings Bank's board of directors, from Alvin Aldifer and those first concerned citizens, to today's community business leaders, have been carriers of the community's culture and stewards of the bank's community mission. All of them are quality people who look through the lens of wanting to do what's right. They're trying to look long range, which is the way our bank has always done it. Understanding that the tone starts from the top, the board followed a deliberate path toward succession, naming Brendan J. McGill as the bank's sixth president and chief operating officer in 2014 to extend the values and business model that had been passed on to him. From the very beginning, um, Ed had put in our annual report, the Proverbs, that a good name is more desired than great riches. And that's a pretty good compass when you're making decisions. You do the right thing, and the right thing's going to happen. A tradition of local decision makers and relationships based on service and trust has proven itself to Harleysville shareholders, who understand the connection between community and bank. When they invest in Harleysville Savings, they know we are a community bank. They know that part of our mission is to give back to the community, because without the community, we're not going to be a successful bank. And that's the beautiful thing of a community banker, that part of my role is not just here at the bank, it's to go out and serve the community. It's a pretty great job. Value for the shareholder, value for the community value for the customer, created by valuing the people of Harleysville Savings Bank, consistently providing an exceptional community banking experience. Harleysville Savings is unique. The culture here, how we treat our team is different because we know that our key to success is our people. You are the bank. I'm looking at Harleysville Savings Bank right now. They're the bank. Our people are the bank. And when they do interact with the public, they're executing our strategic plan. HSB is lucky to have her at the bank, but it's the Sumney Town team who wants to say thanks. You are so important because you're the one that the customer sees. And so the success of the bank depends upon you. And the best thing you can do to make our bank successful is to be a servant. 
Customer service is our primary focus. I can say it is true for us. We are a customer service oriented community bank. The local theme is serving your neighbor. And what our local community is doing, I hope we never forget where we came from and how it started. It's not our bank. We are just fortunate enough to be stewards at this point of this bank, of the history of this bank. Nobody believes that this is their bank. We believe this is the community bank. It's really been a great experience seeing the bank grow the way it has. And we have something unique, we really do. We have something unique there at Harleysville Savings. People need a financial partner they can trust, and that's us. Go, go, go.